Okay. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are extremely honored to have Professor Sarong Gopala Christian uh, to to join us in celebrating the Lunar New Year <laughs> by giving us a talk about his recent research on open systems. Uh, Sarong obtained his bachelor's degree from Armhurst University uh, Armhurst College uh, before he moved on to a pursuing his PhD at UIUC. Uh, now, as a faculty member at Princeton University, his research uh, broadly intersects with man-body physics, quantum information, uh, quantum dynamics, and even computer science. So, um, on this warmest day of this quantum winter, let's give Sarong a warm welcome. Thanks. That's, uh, I guess, a uh very interesting day to be here. Am I going to get some mooncakes at some point? Is that <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, right, so I want to talk about um, um, some stuff that I've been thinking about um, with um, with Kurt and Tibor, who have kind of different attitudes towards that. I guess you can see their faces, um, but um, yeah, it's sort of it's um, it's sort of beginning um, of some project of trying to make sense of what the what the phases of open quantum systems are. Um, when I talk about phases, when I talk about steady state phases, I'm going to talk about something um, fairly specific. So I'm going to think about um, a system coupled to a large um, environment, and I'm mostly going to treat the environment as Markovian for the things I'm going to talk about today, but of course that's an additional um, assumption that you can imagine relaxing. So systems out of equilibrium because, for example, it's coupled to to two bats at different temperatures, um, or and or because it's being driven by um, a classical field. Um, and um, and you know if you keep the system finite and you take the bath to infinity and you take time to infinity, eventually the system's going to come to some steady state, maybe a limit cycle, but like some kind of of, of steady distribution. Um, and um, and so um, what I want to talk about is um, the sense in which these steady states um, can fall into distinct phases, the way equilibrium states fall into distinct phases. So that's go that's going to involve a set of of limits, um, which I'm just going to specify right now. It's just like some choice. It's not um, it's not necessarily the only choice, but it it's it's a reasonable one. The bath, of course, you want to be functioning as a bath, so you want it to be much bigger than the system. So you take the bath to infinity first, um, then you take the system size to infinity, and you let the time the system is evolving go to infinity as well. Um, and I'm going to assume that um, that that's done um, in in a way that um, that that sort of um, you know the time is um, blowing up as some large polynomial of system size um, as as you take both to infinity. But that's that's a bit negotiable. And um, and so right. So um, we know that if you take um, if you take the thermodynamic limit on an equilibrium system, it 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 you know forms um, it goes into some equilibrium state. These equilibrium states form phases. Um, so properties remain kind of the same um, inside a phase, and they change abruptly when you hit a phase transition. That's the boundary of the phase. Um, Right, and so um, why am I thinking about this? Are there non-trivial phases? Um, we know there are because um, effectively um, people constructed a bunch of um, examples in the 70s and 80s um, of, of steady states um, that provably form, um, you know, the, the provably robust perturbations. So there are regions of parameter space where the steady state of a non-equilibrium system um, retain some property. Like for example, it might have long range order. Um, and um, and um, and then um, when you change um, your parameters past a certain value, the, the, the phase goes away, the long range order goes away and you end up in sort of a randomly fluctuating soup of stuff. Um, one thing that's interesting about these um, non-equilibrium phases is that they can have properties um, that equilibrium phases in the same dimension wouldn't. So, for example, um, there's this um, there's this dynamical system called Tomb's rule, um, and um, and its properties. Um, yeah, you can you sort of see what it consists of is is a bunch of domain walls being um, eaten away, but in a sort of patterned um, top to bottom way. Um, so um, 
as as you might all remember, the Ising model in two dimensions um, does order um, at finite temperature, but it only forms an ordered phase um, when the external magnetic field is zero. Um, in in this in 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 in, in Tomb's rule, um, you have ordered states um, that are stable in the presence. You have bistability that's that's robust um, against um, a um, against an external field. So it's like it's ordered in the presence of a finite field. And so, so it's clear that not only are there phases, but the classification of these phases is different than it would be in equilibrium in the same dimensionality. So that, that's, that's some motivation for thinking about these. Now, um, when, what am I going to talk about today? So um, the two basic questions you could ask about, um, about phases of non-equilibrium systems, one of them is um, a really hard question, which um, is constructing and proving um, the existence of, of of certain stable phases. Um, so that's that's um, that would be it'd be very cool if I could do that, but um, but but that's that that's 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 hard, and I'm not going to um, address that question today. I'm going to use results that mathematicians came up with um, establishing these things exist. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a slightly easier question of you know just trying to understand what the landscape. Um, of parameter space in these open systems is like. What does it mean to be in a phase? What properties are in are common across the phase? Um, what changes in a phase transition? Um, and as you'll see when you start thinking about this question, which might seem you know not terribly um, not terribly contentful at first, you you realize there are a bunch of like puzzling um, phenomena that occur out of equilibrium that aren't that you don't really see um, that don't really have equilibrium analogs. Um, I should say, um, as I'm speaking, just just interrupt me if you have questions. Don't don't um, wait for the end. Um, um, right. So so that's that's going to be the rest of this talk. So um, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a quick review of how um, the structure of phases um, at zero temperature um, works, um, and then I'm gonna um, I'm gonna talk about um, what changes. Um, when and what stays the same when you go to uh, open systems. Right, so um, a quick review of um, gapped phases of zero temperature systems. So, um, you know, you've, you've all probably seen phase diagrams. Um, I guess um, yellow and green look the same on this um, screen, but that's okay. So this is, so this is supposed to be green. It's a, it's a region where there's no gap. Um, right, we're talking about zero temperature stuff. So we're talking about the ground state of a Hamiltonian. Um, and um, and so if you like, um, we're talking about the properties of a Hamiltonian um, as well as its ground state. Um, what, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Hamiltonian implies its ground state, but not necessarily the other way around. Um, right, so, um, so, so a gapped um, region, a gapped phase is, um, is, is, is sort of a situation where you have um, some number of, of ground states, um, and they're separated from um, the rest of the spectrum by a by an energy gap that remains order one um, in the thermodynamic um, limit, right? And so um, phase gap phases have um, certain properties um, that are standard. Um, so um, so they have area law entanglement. Um, expectation values evolve smoothly across a gapped phase. Correlation functions evolve smoothly. Um, and then um, there's this interesting um, property that I'll um, revisit, which is called the principle that local perturbations perturb locally. So what that means is I take my Hamiltonian um, and I get to its ground state somehow. Um, and, um, and then what I do starting from ground state is I put in I put in a local perturbation. That's a perturbation that acts in a finite um, region of my space. Um, and I ask um, how the expectation values far away from that finite region change um, in, the, in the new ground state in response to the perturbation. And the idea, again, this is, this is totally intuitive if you've, if you've thought about this stuff, um, is that um, as you go away from the perturbing region, um, the, um, the, the effect of the perturbation decays exponentially with some characteristic correlation length um, that's related to the gap. Okay, so this is sort of a, a, a sort of a dictionary of, of, this is, if you like, a list of, of, of properties of a gapped phase. Um, and, they, uh, and, and so you might say, well, what do they have to do with each other? Where does, where does the, 
you know, what 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 holds this bag of of properties together, um, and um, and so the 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 logic um, I, I think is like nicely formalized by Hastings and Wen um, in um, in a couple of papers around twenty ten is something like this. So uh, inside a gapped phase, um, there's you can construct a path between two points in a gapped phase, and the path remains entirely inside the phase, right? Um, so that's that's what it means to have a gap path connecting two points. Um, and um, and so if you move along a gapped path, um, then by the adiabatic theorem, um, if you do it slow enough, um, you're going to stay in some sense. I'm not going to be super um, super rigorous about. You remain close to the instantaneous ground state by the adiabatic theorem. And you don't have to do this arbitrarily slow. You can just go, if you like, much slower than the um, inverse of the gap. So this 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 says um, that you can go from here to here in finite time. Um, and um, and and the key point is that um, this thing um, now means by the Lieb-Robinson theorem that if you evolve the system for a finite time, um, then there's a light cone. So nothing changes outside the light cone. And so in particular, say the asymptotics of correlators doesn't change um, after a finite time evolution. And so this implies that correlation functions must remain the same um, asymptotically everywhere inside a gapped phase. And so, so the thing that holds all these properties together is this idea that, um, is, is, is this idea that um, any two points um, in the same, any two, yeah, any two points in the same gapped phase are uh, connected um, by a finite time evolution to whatever approximation you care about, um, or equivalently, if you try to decompose the evolution by a um, finite depth um, local unitary circuit, and and so this this is this is what it means for two points to be equivalent um, in this Hastings and Wen perspective, and so the, these so this this characterization makes um, this um, list of properties that I gave you in the previous slide. Um, quite intuitive, uh, because effectively, um, for example, if you want to think about um, long range order, you you, you want to consider um, the correlation function of two points that are very far away. And so what I've drawn here is a unitary circuit um, that, um, that, for example, took my um, initial ground state to my final ground state. By some, I assumed there was such, you know, by the, by the fact that in the gap phase, there is such a circuit. Um, I can write down the circuit, and then I can say, okay, what does it do? Well, um, the key point is that um, the gates that are acting directly on the ground state don't do anything. They just leave it. Um, yeah, sorry. They say the, they say the other end. Um, so, um, so, so I want to compute this correlation function. And so this unitary, for example, is a U dagger that, that crosses out against this U, right? And so, um, so all of these, everything outside the light cone just cancels out. Um, and so if you want to compute this guy, it disconnects into two pieces that are two sort of um, finitely fattened local operators um, that are being evaluated now in the, yeah. So um, a single site operator in, in, at, at point A fattens to a, um, to a finite support operator in point B if they're both in the same phase, yeah. This is the spatial correlation function, um, but the point is the light cone is connecting two points in the phase, right? So um, I say that, um, let me go back to my previous slide, um, if I can figure out how to do that. So so I um, I start out here, I want to I want to I want to argue, the, the thing I'm trying to argue is that um, the long range properties of correlation functions at this point are the same as long range properties at that point, okay? And so the time evolution is the adiabatic time evolution that goes from here to there. Does that, does that make sense? So I'm saying that if I want to evaluate a single site um, operator, a single site, a correlation function between two sites in, the, in, the, in this ground state, then that's like evaluating the, the correlation function of fattened operator at this other point. And so this is here. And so because those two, because, because of the light cone, um, uh, you know, those guys just finitely fattened. I can move them arbitrarily far away. And so I don't change, I don't change the asymptotics, the correlation function. Is that, is that, is that argument clear? You're right. 
yeah, keep keep asking if, if something's unclear. Um, okay, so um, so another one of these properties of um, a phase is this principle that local perturbations perturb locally. So um, I already um, said what this was. So you perturb it locally at some point, um, and um, and so um, in and so because. Um, the key point is that locally, you know, you can you, you, you sort of agiomatically turn on this perturbation um, if the gap remains open at all times throughout turning on the perturbation. So you turn on the perturbation, and that that just corresponds to implementing a finite time evolution on the state. Um, now, if I if I apply a finite time evolution on the state, um, you know, um, these black gates are the um, are the the native Hamiltonian that's H. And the red gates um, are the trotterized version of the perturbation that I'm putting in locally, right? So the black gates um, hitting the ground state are just the Hamiltonian acting the ground state, so don't do anything. So I can so I can just I can just delete them. And so so what I have um, after this finite time evolution is this triangular um, set of non-trivial. Yeah. Um, the vertical axis is time. So the horse, yeah, so let me be very clear about this. So so this is this is my representation of the unperturbed ground state. Um, and so implicitly I'm thinking about it as a matrix product state in one D, but that's not important. So it's just so this guy, so this tensor is um is the unperturbed ground state, and then I'm turning on the perturbation via this time evolution process where I adiabatically ramp it up from zero to some final value. Uh, yeah, so so if you like, um, you know, when I when I draw something that looks like, um, so my way of representing a quantum state of a system is something like that. So it's so if I have five qubits, for example, a five qubit state is a block with five legs sticking out of it, um, which correspond to the states of each of the five qubits. So yeah, thanks. Um, so so this guy, um, you know, so so I, I wrote it out. In this in this um, way with like uh, red lines horizontally, that's not that's not important. The idea is this entire thing, um, this entire tensor is um, it represents the ground state of a many spin system. And now what I'm doing is I'm time evolving. I'm time evolving the ground state. I'm, I'm time evolving it by a circuit because I've made a trotter decomposition. And the circuit almost everywhere doesn't do much because it's the Hamiltonian acting on its own ground state. So it just annihilates the, you know, so, so it, it just goes through, it just, it just returns the ground state. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's, 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 what's, that's what's going on here. Um, and, um, and so um, I, I'm emphasizing this particular feature of, a, um, of, of standard ground states because it's gonna change um, when I go out of equilibrium. Um, okay. Um, so, so that's 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 so that's the kind of structure that you have um, in um, in in um, Hamiltonians um, and their ground states. So the space of Hamiltonians splits into um, a bunch of these gapped regions separated by phase transitions and maybe some gapless phases as well. Um, and so we want to see, okay, what do we what do we do? How much of this can be moved? Can we apply to open quantum systems? So to do that, I'm going to give you now a brief review of what open quantum systems are um, and what specific um, assumptions I'm going to make when I talk about open systems. So I'm going to think about systems in which um, you know you have a system. Your entire universe is um, is in some quantum is undergoing some quantum evolution. Um, um, you care about the state of some part of it. That's your system. Your system interacts with the environment, which is assumed to be prepared in some reference state, which could be either a ground state or a thermal state. It's not important. Um, and, um, and then what you do afterwards is you trace out um, the environment, and that gives you an evolution on the system alone, um, which um, is defined. It's, it's given by a super operator because what it does, it takes, it takes um, any density matrix to a density matrix. Right. So, but it it doesn't it doesn't necessarily take a pure state to a pure state. It it does convert pure states into mixtures. Right. And so, um, so that that this object is called a it's it's a super operator, and we I'm going to call it a quantum channel, um, which is sort of the finite time version of it. I'm also going to use that 
uh, term interchangeably with, with Lindladian, which is what happens, which is basically a quantum channel that's like close to the identity um, from the perspective of this talk. Okay, so um, when you um, think about evaluating things in quantum channels, um, you'll notice that um, you know what you do is you start out with the initial state, then you apply this the super operator to the state, and then in the end you're going to measure some observable, right? Um, and so, um, if you so one way of thinking about um, the super operator is sort of it's it, it takes the input state, it takes the density matrix as a vector, um, and converts it in density matrix to contract that density matrix and operator. Notice that um, observables and density matrices don't you know they both look like um, you know square matrices, but they play and they're both emission they play different roles in this in in, in this in this evolution. Um, this guy is the top of the circuit. This guy is the bottom of the circuit. And think about this as like the sum. This evolution operator is not Hermitian. So when it acts on the right, it does something pretty different from when it acts on the left. Its properties, are, its left acting and right acting properties are fundamentally different. So yeah. So 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 this so these guys live in the dual space in the space of in the space of row vectors. These guys live in the space of of column vectors in this in this sort of d squared dimensional space. Right, um, and so a very important property of, of 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 quantum channels is this thing called the the unital property. So that's so remember that um, the way I got this evolution was by taking um, a system, applying unitaries between the system and the environment that was prepared in a reference state, right? Um, and so um, if I if I if I now um, instead of measuring uh, an observable, I just measure the identity operator. Which is sort of a silly thing to do, but you know, it's a, the identity operator is a kind of it's it's a Hermitian operator. You you think about it as observable, um, and um, and so um, now you look at the circuit, you see that um, there's nothing um, stopping you from contract from um, multiplying the m by the m dagger and cancelling them out, and um, and then you can multiply the u by the u dagger and cancel them out, um, and then what you're left with is that this entire um, this entire revolution. Just becomes um, a um, just becomes a, a, a trivial um, evolution. So if you like um, the um, the identity the identity operator considered as an observable is um, uh, is 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 a is a steady state observable. Uh, and the the intuition here is just that if you don't um, if you don't perturb the system, it doesn't matter when you don't perturb the system. It doesn't. It's the same um, regardless when you do it. Um, but notice that um, this this property, which is going to be very important for us, is not true um, when you act to the right. So if you take if you take a density matrix um, that's the identity, and you apply and you apply this and you apply this entire um, map to it, um, it does not remain the identity. In fact, a simple example of a case where it doesn't is um, is is um, spontaneous decay. You take a maximally mixed state in a qubit. Um, you let it evolve. Um, it just goes to the the ground state. So um, so so you don't expect these things to be. Um, you don't expect the channel to have the unital property acting from bottom to top, but you do expect it to happen from top to bottom. Um, and so the unital property is very important because um, okay, and this is just a so this is just a notation for just combining all the stuff. So what you know because when you have a channel, you have all these. So this, this is a very inefficient way of writing um, the channel because I have an explicit representation of the environment. Um, and then I have all this brass side stuff and all this cat side stuff. So in, in order to do diagrams, um, in order to circuit diagrams involving channels, it's helpful to sort of fold, to fold this entire thing on itself. So the U, so the U dagger is now sitting, has been squished behind the, behind the U. And so the whole thing is just like one, one matrix acting on the on on the density matrix. So the input. So now my fat input leg is a density matrix, and my fat output leg is a density matrix. This box is super operator, and the unital property is just saying that if I um if that if I contract the super operator with um with the identity, you know, interpreted as a state, then um, it's like not having this. So 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 that's right. So let me. So this is this is a better way of saying it. So so um. The unital property of channels is the identity that um, that if I if I take the identity and I apply a channel to it um, from 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 the you know on to the left, then it's like not doing anything. Okay, and so um, this this seems like a rather technical point, but um, but the the significance of it is okay. So um, I don't really need to give you this 
um, example of a channel. Um, um, this is this is yeah maybe I should um, very quickly uh, talk about this. So the idea behind this this is like a spontaneous decay channel. So you start out with some um, with some density matrix, and then what you do is you toss out the density matrix um, by swapping it into the environment, and you replace it with the state zero. Okay, and so this has this has a representation um, in fat line notation that you just bring in whatever you kill it, and then you replace it with a reference state. So that's um, that that's that's just that's just the way this notation works. Okay, why am I telling you all this? Well, uh, the key point is that um, this unital property gives me um, something that functions as a Lee Robinson theorem um, for um, quantum channels. So that basically says that, for example, if I want to evaluate a correlation function between A and B, and my time evolution is given by this open system evolution, um, then I can I can write it out like this, and I can I can I can delete. I can delete all of these um, all of these operations of the channel because they're all acting on they're all acting on the identity to the left so they can remove them. So the 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 fact that um, you know this 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 should remind you of um, of the property that I um, uh, that I specified for the property that I used um, to prove various things about um, about the unitary case. But um, the key point is that it also applies. Light, light cones also exist in in quantum channels. Okay, uh, this shouldn't be this shouldn't be surprising um, because if you like, um, a quantum channel just consists of a unitary evolution involving an, an auxiliary uh, system, and the auxiliary system just um, doesn't carry any correlations. So you're not going to beat the light cone by bringing by bringing extra stuff in that's not sort of moving over long distances. But okay, this is how it works technically. Okay, so so I'm going to talk about um, about the phases of of these circuits that are made up of um, quantum channels, um, and um, and so um, when I when I when I restrict to these guys, um, I leave out um, one very important um, class of examples of um, non equilibrium um, phases, and those are phases that are stabilized by um, active quantum error correction. Um, why is that? Because when I um, perform error correction, even though the error correction operations are local, um, I measure all my um, error syndromes and um, my correction operation is based on global information about the measurement data. So in some sense, even though the, the quantum stuff that I do is local, it's based on, it, it, there is implicitly non-local classical communication um, that my computer performs in order to read out the syndromes and figure out what error correction operation to perform. And so um, and so so the things I'm going to talk about um, don't apply to active error correction. In fact, there's no Lee Robinson theorem for this case. and um, and so the question of how to think about phases of, of active the error corrected systems is a very wide open question. It's not it's not even clear what it means to have phases of such system. So I'm gonna specialize to cases where this doesn't happen. I make, let, let's say that I, um, yeah, any, any measurement data that I, that I collect is used locally. So I don't use measurement out. So when I define the channels I'm gonna talk about, I don't use measurement outcomes at site one to decide what to do at site 25. If I did, then I'd break this entire structure. Um, okay. So, so that's that's what I'm gonna. So that's um, that's I guess what I'm gonna talk about. Um, so um, you know, um, so I have these channels, and I'm gonna make circuits um, consisting of repeated application of some channel, um, and um, I can think about that instead as a repeated application of a Lindblad um, matrix equation. Um, it's sort of from the from the perspective that I'm taking, it's not the distinction is not important, though it's going to be important for some. Um, uh, specific details that I'm not going to talk about today. Right. So, um, so, so these these guys. Um, so I take I take quantum channel and um, and as I as I showed you, it's some matrix acting. On, it's some it's some super operator acting on a density matrix, and the super operator um, is going to take every density matrix eventually to whatever the um, the leading um, eigenvector of, um, of, of 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 this thing is. And this leading eigenvector um, for the channel that has eigenvalue one and it corresponds to steady state, which means that if you take the steady state and you apply 
um, the channel to it, it, it just returns a steady state. Okay. Um, and um, and so um, a special case of these channels are uh, classical Markov chains, um, which are going to give us some of the, the simplest examples of non-trivial phases. So you can make any, you can convert any channel into a Markov chain by just um, uh, appending a, 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 a complete dephasing operation. So, right. Um, right. So, um, you know, what, what, so I am talking about some kind of extreme eigenvector problem in a context where there is Lee Robinson bound. It looks a lot like um, the problem of thinking about ground states of Hamiltonians in, in these respects. So it seems suggestive. It seems that they should, you should have some notion, you should have some set of corresponding notions, but, um, but, but, a, but a few things um, don't seem to work. For example, um, Hamiltonians or unitary operations are always invertible, right? They're inverse unitary operation. Um, and a dissipative process is not invertible. It's inverse. Um, is um, is not physical. Um, and so, you know, can I even think about two points being in the same phase as an equivalent relation? Um, and um, and so that's 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 one that's one thing that would puzzle you. Another thing that might bother you is um the gap of um of a dissipative process um is a um is can be interpreted as a decay rate. Right. So if I take if I take, for example, um, if I take a density matrix and I um, and I look at its time evolution, um, it's something like um, I um, I write it in terms of um, in terms of its eigen um, vectors as um, as um, you know it's it's lambda. So it's um, this is the eigen. I'm, I'm just expanding time evolution the eigen basis, um, and these guys um, these eigen um, values are less than one. So if I apply, if I apply um, the the channel a bunch of times, I'm gonna get exponential decay um, of all the things that are not the same. Right. And so you might say, well, okay, here's a system with a gap. Um, and so um, if um, if I evolve um, for a time much longer than the gap, I'm gonna turn um, I'm gonna turn everything um, into the steady state. So um, I should not have slow relaxation. So the idea of having um, a non-trivial phase um, seems almost incompatible with the idea of having a gap um, quantum channel or a gap Mendeleevian, right? Because in order to have, if I can always start with um, a product with a trivial density matrix, and this argument seems to, seems to suggest that if I take this trivial density matrix and I evolve it to some time much longer the gap, it's just going to turn into a steady state. But then that's saying the steady state was connected to the trivial density matrix by a finite time evolution, which would, in my way of thinking, say they're in the same phase. So you might say, well, this, this doesn't this doesn't make any sense at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So so it's it's just repeated time steps of the of the math. Um so uh, let me let me go back. Um, over here. So um, this, so I, I've done, I've done one and a half iterations. Like this thing is my, is a single iteration, right? And so when I apply the map, say 10 times, it means I'm applying this block um, 10 times in, in succession to, to whatever my initial density matrix was. Um, there is, but when you trotterize, the velocity is set to one. Um, at least in in this in this in this in this trotterization, the velocity is set to one. But yeah, so you want to think about the velocity as being one in this in 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 in, in the circuit construction. You can set it to be five as well, but then that means I've got to draw a lot more gates, and it's kind of painful for me. But that's all. Yeah, it's not. It's just it's just some number. Um. Right. Um, okay. So, so okay. How do you how do you make all this stuff um, fit together? Um, and so, um, to in 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 this next bit, I'm going to try and um, walk you through um, an example of how non-trivial phases of open systems um, can arise. 
Um, and the example I'm going to talk about is not very quantum. In fact, it's completely classical, um, and it is um, a biased um, random walk. So um, it's a biased random walk with open boundary conditions. So um, so if my if my left topic, so I've got a I've got a a, a master equation, a classical master equation where my particle pops to the left at some rate and to the right at some other rate. Um, and um, and if the rates are different and my boundaries and my boundary conditions are open, then I always end up um, uh, sticking to um, either the left wall or the right wall at late times, right? Because um, I'm sort of moving, because if I if I start out in the middle, I'd eventually sort of move all the way to one end. Um, okay, and so, um, a, um, and so a fact about this problem, about this Markov chain or this Markov process is that it's gapped. Um, and um, and so um, why is that um, um, why 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 is that bothersome? Well, you might say, okay, look, um, I have a system of size L. I start the part. Let's say that um, my left hopping wins over my right hopping. Start a particle out here. Um, it's going to take a time of order L to to move all the way over to the boundary where it's going to get stuck. Right. So relaxation time is kind of obviously going to scale with system size. But if I just write down this matrix and diagonalize it, I find that its spectrum has a gap. Okay, so um, what gives? Um, it turns out that if you just write down the extreme limit where there's no left hopping at all, um, it's rather simple to see what's going on. So this is the Markov chain. You'll notice that um, all the columns add up to one, and what the Markov chain does is it pushes everything um, to one end. Um, and so if you look at this matrix, you realize immediately the thing that makes it work out to have both a uh, long relaxation time and a gap is that the matrix is not actually diagonalizable at all. Um, in fact, it's a matrix with a giant Jordan block. Um, and so it, it's it's a so this guy is a, a five by five matrix, but only has two um it only has two eigenvectors. Um, and one of the eigenvectors is a steady state, which corresponds to particle. Um, all the way at one end, and the other eigenvector is this 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 guy, which is going to um, relax after one time step to the to the steady state. But nothing else is an eigenvector. So this is a this is a funny feature of these matrices. You might say, okay, this is this is a fine tuned um, property of this limit of the problem. But what I can do is I can um, I can go away from that limit, and I remain you know qualitatively with the same dynamics. And um, and so, what happens basically is that even when the matrix is diagonalizable, its eigenvectors are almost almost exactly parallel to each other. And so, um, what does this signify physically? It means that if I try to write um, a um, initial state like a particle at the wrong end, it's like you have all your eigenvectors that are pointing this way, um, and you're trying to write some state that's almost perpendicular to all the eigenvectors. Right, it's not exactly perpendicular because there is a complete set of eigenvectors, so there is a way to write the initial state in terms of the eigenbasis. But um, but when you try to do that um, in the large system limit, you find that you need these um, gigantic um, coefficients, which actually blow up exponentially with system size. And so this 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 makes the existence of a gap compatible with um, the Lee Robinson theorem because what happens is that. Um, that if I write the initial state, if I write an initial state like this out in terms of the eigenbasis, um, what I'm going to need is I'm going to need these coefficients um, that are exponentially big in system size. So if I look at the time evolution, it's e to the, it's e to the something times L my, uh, times e to the minus something times T. And so um, the point at which the point at which all these coefficients for non-trivial eigenvectors become small is precisely when, um, when, when t is of order L. So even though there is a gap, the gap um, is compatible um, because the strongly, the strongly non-diagonalizable, strongly non-Hermitian character of the matrix, it's compatible with um, the existence of long relaxation time. Um, the, the way that people think about these matrices is in terms of an object called the pseudo-spectrum. Um, so, um, so remember that the eigenvalues are um, the poles that you think about them as poles are resolved into a matrix. Um, uh, and, um, and so what you do is instead of saying, instead of requiring an exact pole, you say that um, you need, you want to study regions in which the resolvent is big. 
instead of being strictly infinite. So you, you take the resolvent to be large and finite, that defines some that defines some region. If you take it to be, if you take um, epsilon to be not too big, then you have a big blob. Um, and as you make epsilon finer and finer for a finite size matrix, um, then the pseudo spectrum um, condenses into a set of um, little circles around each eigenvalue. Um, and the, the key point is that uh, there's now a pair of limits that don't commute with each other. There's a limit where you take um, the um, where you take epsilon the pseudo spectrum to zero, and and there's the thermodynamic limit. And if you keep if you keep system size finite um, and um, and take and take epsilon to zero, of course you're going to end up with a with a complete set of of eigenvalues, uh, and the pseudo spectrum is going to condense into a bunch of points. But the key point is that if you take the opposite order of limits. Um, you don't. You never form a discrete set of, of eigenvalues. In, instead, the pseudo spectrum um, sort of occupies occupies the entire block from um, it, it occupies the entire spectral bandwidth. So, so what happens is that there's a strict sense in which these matrices become non-diagonalizable in the thermodynamic limit, um, and that's precisely a sense in which the pseudo spectrum doesn't doesn't become a spectrum um, if you take the thermodynamic limit first. Okay, so so you might think Jordan block structure is a curiosity. It's a fine tuned thing, but in fact, Jordan block structure is an emergent feature of um, of a bunch of um, uh, non trivial phases of open systems. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So let me. So yeah, so so what do I mean by non-trivial phase? I mean um, in in the language of my initial definitions, um, some place, um, some some steady state now um, that it's impossible to get to from a um, trivial steady state, which I'm going to take to be the identity density matrix in a finite time. Um, I, I'm not. I actually. I'm. I'm. I'm going about it. I'm going about it the other way around. So, if you think about the hastings when concept of of ground state phases, um, they're not defined, um, if you like, by um, the the fundamental definition is not in terms of like some concrete order parameter. The fundamental definition is uh, a a non trivial a non trivial ground state is one that cannot be reached from a trivial ground state by a finite depth circuit. And so I'm defining open system phases in the same the same basic way, somewhere that I cannot go from a trivial point in a finite time. And so, so long range order automatically implies that you cannot go in finite time because because you have to build up the long range correlations. But of course, there are many types of like strange topological order where you you know you're in a not, you're in a non trivial phase, but you don't you don't necessarily have a an order parameter that's conventional. Um, you define you define order. I'm not saying anything yet about quantum, but yeah, you define you define what it means for an open system to be in some sense in a non-trivial phase. Um, and then ordered phases are going to be a subset of non-trivial phases. Yeah, exactly. Um, in in the equilibrium case, um, I think what ends up happening is that you define quantum order in this way that's like expansive enough that eventually you encompass everything. But in the out of equilibrium setting, um, the notion of a non-trivial phase comes first, and then you have to say, well, you know, what is the what is the parameter? What is the thing that that is the characterizing feature of this non-trivial phase? Um, and that's going to be, you know, I don't, there's no classification of that yet. But I'm, I'm sort of I'm I, right now just defining what it means to even have a classification. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Under under condition that you have, yeah, you have a steady state. You have a steady state. We're talking about the steady. We're talking about a Lindbladian in terms of its steady state. We're going to specialize the case where there is a gap in the spectrum, and um, and we're going to ask about the phases of those guys. Okay. So that, that's that's that, that's that's the uh, that's the structure here. Yeah. Um. Your um everything is is limited by locality, and everything is limited by having to be time independent because I'm talking about um yeah so so each 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 block just repeats over and over and over again. 
because that you know i'm talking about phases of a limb bladder a channel right so, so that means that whatever the time evolution operator is for one like finite amount of time that just repeats It excludes non-locality. It 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 excludes it excludes time dependence beyond like locate time dependence, which I can fold into my definition um, in a natural way. So like the past, I turn off the yeah, that's not allowed. Yeah. Okay. So um. So so the so one interesting consequence of of this. Um, of this nature of this non-trivial, um, you know, okay, so, so I didn't really, I didn't really argue for this being a phase, right? It's just like a, this is just a situation where you get, um, where you get a, um, right, you get a, a non-trivial phase, your non-trivial state. Why am I calling it non-trivial? Because it's qualitatively totally different from um, the uniform distribution um, over um, all states. Um, and so in some sense, it's, 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 um, in, in that sense, at least, it's non-trivial. Um, but I haven't told you about stability. Um, and in fact, um, if you think about completely general perturbations, it's easy to see that this 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 guy is not stable because if I if I include some arbitrarily weak hopping between the left end and the right end, um, then that's going to break this entire structure because now you're going to now now you'll find that the that the new steady state is actually just um, essentially uniform. Um, so, so if I allow completely general perturbations, um, then it is not going to be the case that these um, these states are stable. But if I forbid this um, because of locality, then adding um, adding perturbations like, for example, a bit of right hopping or whatever um, is not going to change the nature of the state. And so it is it is under that restriction in effect. Okay. Okay. So this is this is this is this is a simple example of um, of um, of the kind of thing that I'm going to talk about, but of course, the single particle example um, that I just chose because it was easy to work through. Um, one, 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 one thing that um, you realize when you start thinking about these problems is, in fact, there's a very large family of, of problems that look a lot like um, this um, simple particle on a line example, um, but, um, but they now act on many body state spaces. And in fact, all deterministic cellular automata have this property that um, that their eigen their eigenvalues are either they're either um, magnitude one or magnitude zero. Um, and so, if um, if a cellular automaton has a um, has a unique um, steady state, then it sort of automatically has to have this property, and and it and it takes a long time to get there. Then it automatically has to have this property of uh, of having Jordan blocks having large Jordan blocks in the configuration space, um, and so so this is the sort of very general property of open systems that's true in most cases that we um, that that we looked at, um, and um, and so you know I gave you this example of the instability to adding hopping that goes the wrong way, um, and um, and so um, in the in that example it was clear what what I had to do to forbid it. Um, but the conjecture you might have um, generalizing this to uh, um, any other to general configuration spaces is basically that um, even though there are these Jordan blocks and um, they give rise to long times, um, local perturbations don't move you um, non-locally in the Jordan blocks. They only sort of move you around. So if you have a if you have a big Jordan block, it's like a staircase, um, and um, and so you're um, you're up here. In the steady state, and um, and if you if you move all the way down there, then that destabilizes you. But um, but local perturbation is not allowed to do that. They only um, move you around locally in this um, on on the staircase. That 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 would be that would be the conjecture. For would it for for the structure of um of these of these objects? Um. Okay. So um, I think um, I have um, successfully managed to eat up uh, almost all of my time. So um, and that, that's, 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 that's good. I, I won't, I won't um, go much longer. Um, so um, so that's, that, that's, that's all. That's, that's, in fact, most of um, the part of the talk that's designed to be at all comprehensible. So it's probably a good time to, um, to sort of zip through um, what remains. Um, so yeah, so, so the, the basic principle um, that you draw from, the lesson you draw from this simple example is that um, you, know, you, need, you need a gap. 
and um, and the gap by dimensional analysis is some time scale. Um, and so we've already said the gap doesn't control the relaxation of arbitrary initial states. Um, and so what does it what does it actually do? Um, and um, and so um, the the main the main um, insight into all the stuff is that um, even though general initial states don't relax on a time scale that's set by the gap, um, local perturbations to the steady state relax on a time scale that's set by the gap. And um, and so um, and so when when you when you when you get that, then you're inside a phase. Points different points inside the same phase are connected by local perturbations, and so they relax fast to each other. So you can use you can use the the channel to move efficiently between points in the same phase, but um, but when you try to cross a phase boundary, then the channel becomes very inefficient at moving you into steady state. So that's that's the that's the the sort of um, summary of, um, of of where we ended up, um, and um, and so I'll just um, briefly um, present this um, rather formal definition of how this works. Um, so um, so the idea is that um, you say that you have a you have a channel over here, um, and um, and then um, so you say that um, any any steady state inside this ball around this initial channel can be reached from it um, by a quick evolution. Um, not, you know, so this is just relation among steady states. It's not a relation among general states. And, uh, and so you have to assume this is uniform across, um, across, these, um, across the ball. And then you just sort of um, tile um, the entire phase with these little balls and, and, um, and, and you sort of move from one to the other. Um, uh, you move from any point to the other by going down a sequence of, of, these, um, of these overlapping um, blobs. Um, okay, um, and so um, long story short, um, um, yeah, so so one more thing I should say um, about this, which is you might say, well, you know, what does it mean to say that um, that there's an equivalence relation of phases in open systems? Of course, if I take my arbitrarily complicated um, uh, state and I just depolarize everything, then I can do that in a finite amount of time with a finite depth um, channel. Right, so so what does it mean to um, to think about being in a phase the equivalence relation at all? It seems like it's a hierarchical relation. It turns out that if you define phases in this in this local way, then then actually being in a phase is an equivalence relation. And basically, the point is that um, if you if you imagine um, taking a highly ordered state and then um, and then um, letting it. Um, and then adding, let's say, a depolarizing channel, you have to do it continuously. You, you can't just put it in all at once. And when there's a very weak depolarizing channel, then that corresponds to very long time depolarized. And so there is a diverging time scale, um, even if you even if you go in the direction that you might think is not an equivalence. Uh, okay, so um, let me just zip through the stuff. So um, so you can, long story short, you improve all the same things as you would prove in um, in the equilibrium case. Um, once you use this definition um, that I presented very briefly in the previous slide. Um, and um, and so the one thing that we aren't able to get um, a really good um, theoretical handle on is um, is the spectral gap. So um, so unfortunately, we don't really have good techniques to talk about the gaps um, of, uh, of of general many body matrices. Um, and um, for that, so the conjecture that we have, is that um, the spectral gap is the time it takes um, for um, two points in the same phase to relax to each other, um, two nearby points in the same phase to relax to each other. And to check that, we have to resort to numerics. Um, and, um, and so, um, you know, the, the point in the slide is that it checks out and it seems to work. It's, the, the two things track each other extremely well throughout the phase. Um, and, um, okay, so... Um, I had a comment about quantum order, but it's too much to talk about now. Um, and um, and so um, yeah, so this is this is criterion we came up with. Um, is it actually ever satisfied? Um, we checked explicitly that it was satisfied for some um, non-trivial cellular automata, which have uh, bistability. So in some sense, they're um, they really are non-trivial because they have um, order or conventional sense. Um, right, and and so um, let me let me stop because I've run over. Um, so um, the the basic point of this um, talk was to um, sort of set up the question of what it would 
what, what, what one would be doing if one were to classify phases of open systems and to present some some notion of like what such a classification would look like with a couple of concrete examples. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot remains to be done, including a proper understanding of, um, of, of the space of quantum orders in, um, in open systems. And a very important thing that remains to be um, figured out is how active error correction um, works inside this framework. Like how do you, how do you define phases of, of systems in a way that allows, say, um, the toric code below threshold to be a phase? Um, and, um, and we don't really have a lot to say there because techniques we've been using seem to fall apart because no Lee Robinson's error. Uh, all right, thanks for, for your attention.